Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. I'm Nick and this is MSFS Flight Plans. If you're joining us for the first time, you're about to discover that all we do is try to find the coolest looking places in the sim to fly over and learn as much as we can about what's down there on the ground just to give you one more reason to get up in the air again and again. Maybe some of these places you've been to before and even if you have, I hope you'll find them a lot more interesting, maybe even interesting enough to take another look at them. And of course, as we do that, we'll be checking out all the cool add-ons that I've got installed. I'll tell you all about that in a minute. The scenery out here in this area is just wonderful, so I'll tell you about what that is. But let's not delay. Let's go ahead and get in and get going, and I'll tell you about how I wound up out here. And as you can see, we are in the Mooney. Again, the last time we were in this plane actually was, I think, our Utah flight. And a funny little story about that. There was a guy who <laughs> left a comment and said, I think he's one of our members, and he said, you know, I just don't like the Mooney. And I was like, why? I mean, it looks awesome in the sim. It flies good, why don't you like about it? And he had a real world reason why he didn't like it. And I said, well, I can't argue with that because I don't know anything about that. So that was kind of cool to get a little real world feedback, but I do like flying this one in the sim. So we're up in it again today. So the reason why I'm out here, and I'll tell you where we are in just a second, is because I was looking around the borders, the southern borders of Belgium and Luxembourg, flying along the Meuse River after a recommendation from one of our members. And I'm still checking that out, by the way, so we may t wind up taking a flight out there. And I saw that in France there was a lot of chateaus, and I thought, well, I love chateaus, I love castles, let's go see what's out there as far as add-ons go. And there's a few of them that are actually already done up in the sim. Oh, sorry guys, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here. <laughs> Good grief. And it turns out there's not only a lot of chateaus, but a lot of add-ons available. There's only a handful that are already default added on in the sim. When I started looking around, I found out there was tons of them. And so I started bookmarking them to try to lay out a flight plan. And I discovered that along the Loire River, which is where we're going to be going today, there's an extremely high concentration of these things. And since there were so many add-ons available, I figured, well, let's go ahead and do it. So that's where we are. And this little strip that we're at is a place called Sucel, Lima Foxtrot 50. And it's about nine miles northeast of the town of Angers, which we will be heading down to. We'll fly south into that. There's a little turnaround strip up here, but I can't remember which side it is. A little turnaround spot. I'll just come this way and we'll figure it out once we get down there. Man, this thing is touchy on the old rudder pedals. And all of the add-ons that I've got included on this flight, I, of course, will have in the video description. And there's going to be some caveats for these. So this is going to be a little bit longer flight, probably about 160 miles, but probably won't be any longer than our other longer flights, probably a little over an hour in the air. And if you want to skip around, that's totally fine. But if you want to add the add-ons into it, you'll want to make sure you at least find the part of the video where I talk about that because most of these are not simply drag and drop. So you'll need some additional instruction if you haven't already taken this flight and put these add-ons in your community folder. So stick around for that. And I'll also give you an update. I made a huge breakthrough. You probably heard me griping about all the add-ons, probably 25% of them or so recently. I have not been able to install after downloading them in Flight Sim. And I found out why, and I found out how to fix it. So I'll tell you that too. All right, one notch of flaps, and we're just going to barely clear these trees at the end of the runway, so I'm going to go ahead and throttle up all the way, and then let the brakes go. All right, away we go. And I tried to install the fall seasons from Rex Accu season, and it was, uh, there was just a recent update for that, and I think it screwed something up, so I made it uninstall it and reinstall it because it looked like some big patches of ground had been like burned up by a forest fire or something and it wasn't that way before I tried to turn the fall on so I don't know what's going on with that and of course if this is your first time here I always include the flight plan download link in the video description as well so if you want to take this exact flight you can pull it from our video put it in a little nav map and then pull it right into the sim and if you don't know how to do that there's a brief tutorial video I made a couple months ago if you scroll down through our videos you can find out how to do that all right gears up and flaps up and get the navigation on and we're good so the one thing that you'll notice that I caught right outside of this airport here and I redrew our flight plan to go around it is that on this side of this little seam here it looks like it's recently turned spring and on this side is probably a little bit more accurate for this time of year and this line goes all the way as far as the eye can see so we're gonna turn left here in just a minute so that'll kinda of be out of our field of view but despite the coloration it still looks fantastic all the bridges in here look good, and there aren't any real big bridges, but the little ones that are all down by the water, we're going to be flying over a lot of rivers, all look really good, as do all the little towns. We'll get a little bit of stuttering and popping down over the big city areas, because that's where the add-ons are, and that just happens sometimes, but all the rest of it looks pretty good, and I don't think it's a distraction by any means. 
So we'll start off by getting something off my chest. I was not aware that a chateau is, I think, the same thing as a castle. In fact, it may be the French word for castle, and I don't speak French, and which is why I'm not going to do a good job with any of these place names, but I'm going give to it, give it the old college try. But if you do speak French, let me know if I'm right about that. Look at this stuff down here. Look how good that looks. Just amazing. But if you saw our Bordeaux flight out to that big sand dune, you probably noticed I was using the words chateau and castle as if they described two different things, and I was under the impression initially that a chateau is more like what we would describe as a manor house or a country house if we were up in the UK. And those definitely look like two different things. I'm going to get our manifold pressure down to about 18 here. We don't need to be ripping through all this. Let me just adjust that and I'll get back to that subject. But I think that a chateau and a castle in French are describing the same place. And the second thing I noticed about these in France is that they're very, their styling is very distinctive versus what we saw in the UK. You know, in the UK they have kind of that crenulated wall along the top of the outer walls and around the turrets, which usually don't have any towers, you know, or roofs on top of the turrets. That's not the case out here. There will be some older castles that are the foundations of some of these that still have that older look, but the, the central part, which I would call the manor house if we were in the UK, looks a lot like what you'd see if you went to Disney World. Big, tall, rounded towers with pointy tops on them. Very, very distinctive. And they do look beautiful out here, too. But in trying to figure out why so many of these were built along the Loire Valley, it appears that this area, which was also known as the Garden of France, became very attractive to aristocrats and royals after the end of the Hundred Years' War in the 15th century. So I think it's kind of like Newport, Rhode Island, if you've ever been there, during the Victorian era, when they were building all those mansions up there. I hope you haven't been there in the Sim, because... I flew out there thinking it would look good, and it did not. But if you've been there in real life, you've seen them, and you know what I'm talking about. So I think the wealthy were just looking for a place that was close enough to show off their opulence to all their neighbors, which is why they stuck so many of them down here along the Loire. So some of those guys either started converting older existing castles, as you'll see a lot of examples of that out here, into opulent palaces, while others just scooped up thousands or even hundreds of thousands of acres of land and then hired the famous architects of the area to come out here and build up these massive, bespoke estates. Alright, so we're already about to come up on our first place, and I'm going to break you guys in gently. We're about to turn the, the, let's see, south towards Angers. And as we do that, you'll see a place called the Chateau de Plessé Mas. And unfortunately, this is one of the only sites on this trip that does not look like it should in real life. But we had to fly this direction anyway, so I figured I'd at least mention it. And despite being one of the larger ones out here, unfortunately, there were no mods available for this. And the first thing on this site was built in the 11th century, and that was a giant wooden fortress that was used to defend the town of Angers from northern invaders. Because this is north of Angers, as you'll see in just a moment. And then a hundred years later, the Duplessis family, who were actually Italian, acquired the site, along with over 120,000 acres of the surrounding land, and replaced the wooden structures with stone. And then it fell in English hands during the Hundred Years' War and set derelict until acquired by Louis de Beaumont in the 1400s, who served both the English and then the French crown. And he took it, took it over and turned it into what we're going to see down here in just a second. And what we will see is some very faint-looking turrets and a little bit of a moat, but it looks a little bit more like a strip center for the rest of it than a chateau or a castle. And this is going to be it right here. This, I guess, would be his front lawn, this big open space. And you can see right along there is where the moat would be. And you can see some of the turrets. There's one right there on the corner. And then a couple more down here. There's one right down there. But this should be a big outer wall that looks very much like those castles we saw in Wales in real life. And, of course, at the end, I'll show you all this stuff on the satellite map. And it's too bad that doesn't look good because all the rest of the land around there just looks amazing. I mean, even the texturing of the grass. You can see the dead spots in it and everything. What's that down there? A little koi pond or something? Beautiful. Alright, this next spot was a real curiosity to me. At first glance, I thought it was a road course of some kind. It's going to be this whole area right here. Because there's a track that runs all through this, winding all the way through everything. And when I got down close to it in Google, I was trying to find some place names that would indicate what it was. And all I could find, there were no grandstands or bleachers, so I knew it probably wasn't a track. So I thought maybe it was a proving ground for a car company. But I think it's actually a military installation of some kind. And on this side of it, which you can't really see now, but you will in a minute, there's a landing strip that runs all the way down this eastern side of it. You can see a little bit there. But you can't select it in the sim. 
So you can't take off from that unless you land there first. But as a testament to how good the detailing is going to be on this whole flight, check out some of these features I'm going to show you. Look at this little hill right here. They could have just made that totally flat and no one would have known, no one would have known anything about it. But they didn't. And down here is another testament to why I think this is military. There's a couple of little berms which are probably for a shooting range. And I know because we've got some places like this that the SWAT teams practice at down here in Jacksonville. You see one there, that little 90 degree one? They could have made that flat, but they didn't, thankfully. And then out here, you see this twisty one? And you can't see it now because of the trees, but there is a building down there with little rooms in it, with a roof taken off of it, which looks a lot like one of those urban warfare training areas, which is pretty cool, but you can see all the little tracks and stuff winding around there. And when I zoomed in, I couldn't see a single plane, couldn't see any, any military vehicles of any kind, so I don't know what's going on with that. But it definitely looks fantastic, doesn't it? All right, let me slow down a little bit more. Let's adjust our mixture a little bit, save some fuel. And I do need to remember to switch the fuel tanks on this thing. All right, so up here is the town of Angers, once known as the Black City, due to all the slate roofs that were originally down here, mined from a local quarry. And today it's known for its rich cultural heritage, AKA tourism. And I read it's also a big horticulture center, being home to the headquarters of the Community Plant Variety Office, whatever that is. And once we come across this river up here, this is not the Loire, that's the Loire running down that way. This is gonna be the Maine River, spelled just like the state of Maine here in the US. And once we get over this river, you're going to see the Chateau de Angers. And that's one of the ones, like many of the others, that was converted from an old military fortress. And they left the outer castle walls, which are very well defined. And then built up the, I guess, lack of a better word. I keep wanting to call it the chateau part of it, but the part where you live in, I guess, is built up in the middle of all that. And the military fortress, they said, was built around the 9th century and then expanded to what we're going to see in the 1200s. And then just to the east of that is going to be the Cathedral of Cathedral of Angers, which is an absolutely stunning looking place, especially if you look at it from the ground, really big. And the first cathedral down there, which is this right here, was built up in 396 AD. And here's the, here's the castle here. See those outer walls? We're getting a little bit of popping, but we're expecting that. And there's the, I'm just going to call that the chateau. There's the chateau part of it there. Look at that. Look how good it looks. These are both add-ons. And of the two uh, developers that made all the add-ons for this, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, this guy that made these and some of the others made them all darker than the surrounding landscape. And I'm not sure why, because it looks a little unnatural, but I'm kind of thankful because it makes them easy to spot. And that looks like he did that too, because it's a little darker as well. But the cathedral burned down. And they built up another one in 1025. That one burned to the ground just seven years later. Can you imagine building something like that and watching it burn after seven years and how often that happened? So they decided to take their dear sweet time on the next one. And this here is uh, Raymond Coppa Stadium for soccer, of course, out here. But it took them about 500 years to complete the one that we see there now. That was finished in 1523, that cathedral. And thankfully that hasn't burned down again yet. So inside that chateau, we only had a second to fly over it, but I'll tell you about it now. There's something called the Apocalypse Tapestry. And that thing is very old and very massive. It's in six segments and it's 20 feet high and over 400 feet long. And before I started looking into that, just to reveal my ignorance about artwork, old artwork, and you notice if you see a lot of really old houses, big old houses, you notice that the oldest ones seem to have a lot of tapestries hanging on the walls while the newer ones, relatively speaking, usually have those gigantic portraits in them. Well, I had thought that tapestries were just really nice rugs that they made that they didn't want people stepping on and ruining them so they put them on the walls. But apparently those are all from a period called the Great Period of Tapestry, which started around 1350 and lasted all the way up until about 1600, and they were made to hang on walls. And in 1600 is when people started shifting more to those hyper-realistic and hyper-creepy portraits. But that one, as the name indicates, is uh, depicts scenes from the Apocalypse, from the Book of Revelation. And I don't know why someone would want to hang something that huge depicting that kind of scene on their walls, but... I guess if you're spending all your time in a dark, dank castle without any running water or electricity, maybe that's just what you need to lift your spirits a little bit. All right, this next place is going to be called the Chateau de Brissac. And this one also started life as a castle built in the 11th century by the Counts of Anjou. and was later gifted to the French crusader knight Guillaume de Rocher by King Philip II of France, who incidentally was the first to call himself the King of France. Everyone before him referred to themselves as the King of the Franks. 
And this place was severely damaged during the French Wars of Religion, which is when the Catholics and newly birthed Protestant factions started trading blows out here in the late 1500s. Which is always a good look for any religion. If you can't agree on something, kill each other. And after the dust from all that settled, King Henry IV granted the property and the money to rebuild it to a local nobleman named Charles de Cosse. And once he was done working it over, this place being seven stories high, and this is it right down here, it was the tallest chateau in all of France. And we'll get a good look at it here because we're going to turn around this way. And it looks like from where the sun is, there's some shadows on this side, but I think because the sun will be hitting the other side, we should see some really nice details once we come around. And I probably don't need to tell you this, but there are tons of other chateaus out here, and quite a few more even along this route. But I decided not to point them all out, because you can tell that we've just got back-to-back -back information downloads here, and there wouldn't have been time to talk about every one of them. All right, let's spot this thing once we come around here. And there it is. Yeah, it's too dark on this side. Wait till we turn around, you'll see the other side real nicely. We might have to look at it over the wing. Seven stories tall, that thing is. Which is pretty dang big for something that old. Come on, let us have another little peek at it. There it is. Look at that. Wow. And if you venture further from this region, there are many, many other chateaus. Many of them also look fantastic and have the freeware add-ons, but they're a lot more spread out than everything we're looking at on this flight. So it wouldn't have been real conducive unless we wanted to have a lot of dead air in between them or we're looking at some other stuff. But this is a chateau-centric flight, so that's what we're sticking to here. And I'm sure we'll eventually get to see many others too as we work our way across other parts of France. But there's just so much history out here and so much beautiful stuff to see. You could probably just throw a dart at a map of France and then take off from the nearest airport and see all kinds of cool stuff. Alright, we're flying parallel to the Loire now. That's it over there. And we've got just a few minutes... So I'm going to tell you about these add-ons if you want to download them from flightsim.to and again I'll have the links in the description. For one thing, if you just put in the search bar, chateaus, you'll see that there's lots and lots and lots of them. But some of those, if not most of them, are older than the world updates in the sim for France. So do not install the ones that are already in place in the default now because they did touch up some of them when they did the world update or else they will not get along. So don't put an add-on on top of one that's already in the sim. You'll need to see what's in the sim, and then make sure that you don't double up. So if you download just the ones on our description, those are the ones that are not in the sim. So that'll make that step easier. And if you get one of the full cities like Angers, Tours, or Blois, all of which will fly over, and I also have links for those, you'll want to make sure that you don't also install the chateaus in those cities because they are included with those city packs. So there's another opportunity to accidentally double something up. And lastly, one of the links I'm going to post will take you to a mega pack for chateaus all over France, including many of the ones on this flight. And when you open that main folder, just pick and choose. You'll see all the different chateaus listed in their own folders. Just pick the ones that you want to install from there. Don't throw the whole thing in there or you may also accidentally double up. And you'll have stuff that doesn't look right if it shows up at all. All right, so this was the huge breakthrough that I had, guys. And this was like... <laughs> I felt like I just entered the sim all over again. That's how big of a deal this was. And I'm going to assume that I'm once again arriving late at this party. Because you guys may already know this. But you've probably heard me complaining that I was trying to download something. or I, There's no problem downloading it, but installing it in the sim. Once I opened the download, my computer was saying, what do you want us to do with this thing? They didn't recognize the folder or the file. Specifically files with extensions .rar or .7z. And my initial thought was that these were just some devs that were rebelling against Flight Sim after that brouhaha earlier this year, maybe taking their stuff offline. But after reading some of the reviews of the add-ons, I saw that a lot of guys had reviewed them just in the last month or so, so I figured I had been missing something. It turns out I was. So if you want to install, if you want to install these add-ons with those file extensions, and if your computer can't open them, it'll let you know. You need to install a freeware extractor called 7-Zip, and there may be other stuff like this but the one I found that was free is called 7-Zip. So just Google that and it'll take you to the place where you can download it. And it looked kind of sketchy uh, when I got it because it is freeware and it's very, very basic. It looked like something from you know, early versions of Windows. And I was kind of afraid to install it because I thought it might put some kind of malware on my computer, but I figured I'd take one for the team and I did it anyway, and sure enough, it works. So now all these add-ons that were just out of my reach, which I would guess was at least 25% of them again recently, including several on this flight, are now available for us to enjoy on the channel. So that being said, if you want to open some of the ones I've linked, you're going to need that application or something like it if you're not already 
doing that. And if you're not tech savvy or if it looks a little intimidating to you, let me know. Maybe I'll put up a little quick tutorial video on how to do that as well. And there's something I had to figure out with a little trial and error. And this will only apply to the folders where you have to extract it with that 7-zip application. You can't just throw the extracted folder in there. So click on the main folder and keep drilling down until you get with a folder that get to a folder that says content info and scenery. There'll be those two folders in there. And when you get there, you've gone too far. So just back up one level and that's the one that you want to stick in your community folder. And you'll be good to go. If you throw the whole folder in there, it won't do anything. It won't mess your computer up, but it won't add the add-on. Okay, so we've got the Loire up here right in front of us once again. And there's going to be a little tributary that's going to split off to the west called the Thoe River. It's very small. You'll barely be able to see it. And situated between them is the town of Samur. Or Samur, maybe. And between, there's going to be three bridges. Between the first and second ones up here on this side of the river, we'll see the grounds of a place called the Military School of Samur. And the far end of that place is the Museum of Calvary, which just looks like a little building here in the sim, but I strongly encourage you to check that out online because it is cool. They got all kinds of tanks and weapons and suits of armor in there. And one of the suits of armor, I saw a picture of it, it looks like a breastplate, well, heck, it's definitely a breastplate, has these massive puncture holes in the front of it, where it looks like someone either stabbed whoever was wearing it with a pike or maybe one of those big battle axes with a spike on the other end of it. But it looks nasty and really cool. So check that place out online if you're into old armor with puncture holes in it. All right, so I'll tell you about uh, the, sh the chateau as well, because you're going to want to just take this in once we get up here. And you can already see it. This is the chateau up here. But it's called the Chateau de Samur, and that place was also built on the site of a 10th century castle that was a stronghold designed to defend against Norman attacks. And then it was further reinforced in the 1200s, which is when I think they built up the pointed ramparts that are around it that you're going to see, and then converted the main structure to a royal residence. And it was renovated to its current form in 1360 by a French prince named Louis I of Anjou, who I don't think contributed much to history other than this castle which I'm grateful for, because as you're going to see, it looks awesome. Look at this bridge up here. Right along the water, and it looks good. Isn't that a treat? And even this little skinny one up here, you know when they're farther away, they sometimes disappear, but you can tell it's not a Lego brick laying across the water, which is great. All right, let me lean over a little bit here. So right here is what I guess you'd probably call the, the parade grounds of the Calvary place. It looks like a field, so if there's a school there, maybe their athletic teams play there. There's where the museum is, and in just a second, you're going to see this chateau here, which just looks incredible. There it is, peeking into view. And it reminds me a lot of Disney World, this one in particular. Here it comes. Look at that thing. Unbelievable. And here's the little rampart sticking out from the old fortification that was there. I think there's another one on this side, but it's being blocked by our little rim of our window there. Pretty cool, huh? And this town, uh, aside from its incredible looking fortress chateau, has another very ancient and very interesting feature, which we won't be able to see because we're right over it right now and it's covered with trees anyway. But it's definitely cool enough to mention. It's called the Dolmen de Samur. If you don't know what a dolmen is, don't feel bad, because I didn't either. I'd recognized it, because I've seen them in other places, but I didn't know they're called dolmens. But they're megalithic portal tombs, which means they just have an opening on one end of them. And they're usually made with giant side stones that are supporting even more giant horizontal capstones, or tables, from which somehow the term dolmen is derived. Well, it turns out there's no shortage of dolmens in France, with this being one of as many as 4,500 spread around the countryside. But this one, they think, is probably the largest of them all. It's 75 feet long. And I encourage you to take a look at that online, too. Just Google the Dolmen of Samur. It is huge. There's a picture of a guy standing inside of it, and it is just ridiculous. And about 5,000 years old, they think. So if, like me, you're completely bewildered about how these ancient people around the entire world, some much older than this place, could move these massive stones, take a look at that thing. And I recently saw a documentary where they were, I don't know, maybe it was ancient aliens or something like that, where they're at one of these sites with these giant, giant megaliths. I mean, some of these things weigh almost 100 tons, and they had a guy that owns a heavy, a heavy equipment company come down and take a look at him. And it was, the conversation went something like, you know, what would it take to move this? And the guy was like, I don't think we have anything that could move a stone like that. And so that's quite an enigma. 
how those guys that could barely make a stone hand axe were able to move these gigantic, gigantic boulders around and shape them. Just crazy. Because it's not like there's a lot of rock outcroppings around here. I don't even know where they got that stuff from. Maybe they're just laying around on the ground. All right, next we have Font... Let's see if I can say this right. Fontevro Abbey. And as the name implies, it is an abbey. And very old. With a lot of, a lot of what we're going to see today was built around 1800. They converted it to a prison for a while. But the oldest monastic structure started going up in 1101. And some portions of that are still standing. And aside from being quite the scene to behold from the outside, as you're going to see here in a minute, within it, you can see the tombs of some notable monarchs, including King Henry II of England and his wife Eleanor of Aquitaine, who you may recall from our Bordeaux flight. We saw one of her houses up there. Along with her son, Richard the Lionheart, also a king of England. He's buried in there. All right, it's going to come into view right now. That's it right there. Also an add-on. Beautiful, beautiful looking complex. And then we've got uh, England's King John is buried there. Another one of Henry's sons who died of dysentery in 1216. I'm sure that was pleasant. Along with his wife. She didn't die of dysentery, but she's also buried there. And here's an interesting little bit of trivia about that place. Even though Eleanor's tomb is in there, I read that her body is not. So I don't know if it was in there and then they moved it, or if something happened to her body and they just made a tomb for her. But wherever it is now, I could not find that. And I tried Googling where is Eleanor of Aquitaine buried and couldn't find any information about it. So any of you that are as nerdy as me want a little homework assignment, see if you can figure that out. Find out where Eleanor of Aquitaine is buried. All right, moving right along. Right up here is going to be the village of Shannon. And they have a big fortress and a castle down here. And it was one of those places that I couldn't originally open because it was one of those files. And so on my first flights out here, I just said, well, heck with it. Because without the add-ons, it just looks like a hill with a couple little houses on it. Now it looks amazing. So now we're going to go take a look at it. And this is going to tuck itself quite nicely into our stream of exploration because it was the former home of the previously mentioned King Henry II and also where he died before they hauled his body back up to that abbey that we just looked at. And this river here is the Vienne, which is split off to the south from the Loire, which we will rejoin shortly. And be, there's the Loire up there, actually. So they come together back there behind us, and because of the proximity that confluence this area, they said, has been inhabited since prehistoric times, with a Roman fort being the first recorded building up on top of this hill where the chateau is now. And that was constructed around the 5th century A.D., which would have been very, very late in the Roman occupation period. So maybe it was their last hurrah. And the castle was first built in the 900s by Theobald I, Count of Blois. And after that, it changed hands a few times until King Henry captured it from his brother Geoffrey, after which Henry built most of the structures we're going to see today. And that was around the late 12th century, for those of you keeping track at home. I'm going to lean out my window here and see where it is. Not quite there yet. we got to take a right turn here. And you know, now that I'm looking at it, we are seeing some different colorations. I don't know why. Most of it, this looks like it's probably very fallish, but then again, down here, it's kind of green again. And this uh, add-on pack for this place is for the whole town, and it includes the castle. So the reason why I think this area is going to look a little bit different colored than the rest of it is because the developer made the whole town and the castle up there. And it all looks pretty good. There were some trees that looked a little funky, but other than that, and they're hard to spot. If you weren't as picky as me, you'd probably never even notice. All right, you can see the walls of the castle right here, and it'll look real clear here in just a second. But there's a bridge. The main bridge that comes through town goes across the river right here, and we'll take a look at that as we start to turn. We'll look back over there and see it. And it kind of splits the castle in two. Most of it's going to be on this side of it here, as you're going to see. And that's where the bigger parts of the structures are. But on the other side, there's also some more of the castle. So I'm going to guess that that was probably the main river crossing around here. And they built that castle up to control entry into or out of this region. Look at that. Look how brown that is. That's odd. I hadn't noticed that before. All right, so there's the castle. And most of it today, I watched some tours of that place on YouTube. Looks like everything around the outsides is in ruins. But let me see if I can peek under there. This little part here has windows on it, and there's a little museum. Probably has climate control. So they kept a portion of it in good working order so you could crawl around in there. And when we turn, I'll look back over my shoulder so you can see that bridge cutting through up through the middle of it. But it looks really neat. And they walked all through the town on the video that I was watching. It was really neat. All right, let's turn around here. So there's the... No, that's not the bridge there. Yeah, it is. Okay, so there's the bridge that comes over there, which also looks great. And you can see it would just kind of come right up here and split the castle in two, because there's another little portion of it over here. 
but that is neat. Man, that bridge looks good. Wow. Very nice. Very, very nice. Yeah, like on that last flight, when I turn my head, I can see a little bit of frame rate issues, but other than that, if I'm just doing it slowly enough, I can't really tell. But I do have everything kind of cranked up here, so that may be what's going on with that. So I've kind of been thinking, guys, about uh, my birthday was just this last weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, I'm 47 now, and I didn't realize I was 47 until a few weeks before that. I thought I was turning 45. So what a disappointment that was. But I still feel like I'm 21, so I guess it's all relative. And with all my Amazon gift cards and all that, I've really finally started putting some thought to getting a VR headset. And I've had other guys on the channel say, hey, man, you got to try out VR. It's crazy. We couldn't do it for these videos because when you try to film them, they look kind of funny. So for what we're doing here on this channel, the standard, you know, using my head tracker is probably the way to go. But I do want to try flying with the VR. But in looking at some of the reviews for them, a lot of the guys are saying that, uh, what, the, what is it called, the Pimar Pixel or something like that? Seems to be the latest and greatest. And I think they just cut that in half for the price from $2,000 to 1000 And everyone was saying that's the greatest. But they're saying they're about to come up with another next, a whole bunch of new ones that will kind of be the next gen. So I don't want to drop anywhere from, what, 500 to to 1000 bucks on a VR headset only to have something better come out in a couple months. So if you guys have any thoughts on that, let me know. You can either drop it in the comments or if anyone wants to email me, I should say this more often than I do. Our email address is msfsflightplans at gmail.com. So if for whatever reason you want to keep your mask on and not make any comments on the channel page, that's totally cool. Just shoot me an email. But I'd like to get y'all's take on that. I know some of you probably explore that a lot deeper than me. And since I spend all my time researching our flights, that'll save me a little hassle on the side. I just don't know if I should spend the money now or just wait to see what the next stuff is that comes out. I'm thinking when MSFS 2024 comes out, I may go ahead and just rebuild my computer anyway. This one's a few years old now. I could probably sell off the parts for half the price of a new one, but if I'm going to get the VR, I probably want to get the 4090. But even in that regard, I heard the new, the next gen G, uh, graphics cards are supposed to be just insane too. So I don't know. I don't know what to do. Love to hear your thoughts on that. All right, our next place should also look pretty good, and it was one of the add-ons as well. It's known as the Chateau de Aze Le Rideau, named after the town in which it's located, which is right up here ahead of us. And this one's a bit smaller than those last couple, but as you'll see, it's perched out on an island in the middle of a river, which is pretty cool. But the way that it's situated makes it look more like it's sitting on a little pond. But we'll see one in a little bit that's clearly in the middle of a river, and awesome. But this one was completed in 1527, and many believe it to be one of the best examples of early French Renaissance architecture. Don't know what that means, because I don't know the difference between the different phases of French architecture, but if you do, this may be one of the earliest, best examples of it. And by now, you won't be shocked to hear that a much older castle once stood on this site that was built in the 1100s to control the only local crossing of this waterway, which isn't real substantial, so you'd think, you'd, you know, take a big hop, you might be able to get across it. And this, by the way, is called the Indre River. And there's the Loire running still up there to our left. And in 1418, during the Hundred Years' War, soon to be King Charles VII retreated through this area while running away from Paris, apparently taking offense to some insults hurled at him by troops occupying the town. So he told his guys to go back and let everyone know what's up. And when they got back to the town, the offenders realized that they probably should have just kept their mouths shut. And he had all 250 of them captured and executed. And then he burned the fortress to the ground. And that event was so significant that for a while the town was called Aze Le Brule, which means Aze the Burnt. I think they stopped calling it that in the 18th century then. All right, let's see if we can spot this place here. All right, there's, you really can't even tell there's a river coming down through. This is going to be it right here. And I think probably originally when they built it, it was completely surrounded by water. I think they had a little gangplank or, you know, drawbridge or something down there. But that's it. Boy, it looks really rinky-dink compared to those last two places, huh? Yeah, see, look how little that river is. Maybe it was a lot bigger at one time because... <laughs> yeah, we can defend this spot. Don't you dare think about coming across down here. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool, though. Really neat looking. So the guy who built that place was named... Guillet Bar Bartholo, which looks like Bartholomew if you just glance at it real quick. And he was then mayor of the nearby city of Tours and treasurer general of the king's finances. But Bartholo didn't want just your run of the mill mansion. He wanted something to reflect his power and its military history. So he petitioned the king for the extra funds to reinforce the home by exaggerating the condition of the town, saying, I'm going to quote you here. 
Within the town, there are many public thieves, footpads, and other vagabonds, evildoers committing affrays, disputes, thefts, larcenies, outrages, extortion, and sundry other evils which threaten towns like Azalea Rideau. And the king relented. He gave him the money to build that place up just how he wanted, without apparently ever questioning why anyone would want to build a house near a town like that. Alright, this is about the halfway point, so if you need to pause and take a whiz or get a drink or something like that, pour a bucket of popcorn, now would probably be the time to do it. But believe it or not, the best is definitely yet to come. So we're heading northeast now on our way back to the Loire, which we'll hit here in just a minute. And we're going to have two sites up here. The first is the Chateau de Villandre, or Viandre, I'm not sure how to say that in French, with its spectacular gardens. And the first part of the current castle to be built was the Towering Keep, which is still visible as the highest portion of the structure today. And that was erected around 1000 AD. And the rest of what we see down there was built in the 16th century by Jean Le Breton, the finance minister to King Francis I. And it's the last of these huge Renaissance-era chateaus to be built in the Loire Valley. So this is the newest one of all the ones we're going to be looking at today. Let's see if we can spot the gardens of this place. That's really the thing that's going to stick out to you. Here they are, right here. Look at that. So there's the chateau, and you cannot miss those gardens. That place is big, and we're not going to see... Well, we'll see one more place that has gardens comparable to that, but that is impressive. In 1906, Ann Coleman, heiress to the American Coleman fortune and sugar mama to Joaquin Carvalho, purchased the estate, and she's the one that's responsible for adding those gardens to it. Bring a little American flavor and American money over there. Now this next one is going to be the most traditional looking castle building that we're going to see on this whole trip. And it's just a few miles to the west of Tours, and I spotted it as I was skimming the northern bank of the river for interesting things to see. But there's not any information about what it is on the Google map. I have no idea what it is, but I'll point it out when we get there. And then I'll show it to you on the satellite map when we're done. But I'm thinking it might be someone's private residence that they just built to look like a big castle because there's a modern looking swimming pool next to it. And that's not something you'd usually see. And it's got like lawn chairs and everything down there by it. Not something you'd usually see by a big tourist stop. Or maybe they convert it to a hotel, but if that was the case, you'd think it'd be mentioned in Google. All right, here it is right here. It's just peeking into view. So we're going to take a look at this thing. I think you can even see the swimming pool. Let's see if we can spot it. Look at that. See that there? And there's a swimming pool. And this is all part of their property here because it's got a fence going around it. So these are probably guest houses of some kind over here. Look at that place. Nothing at all about it. Nothing anywhere near it even. So don't know what that is. If you know, let us know. And just ahead of us to our right up here is the city of Tours, and it looks like Tours, but for some reason those French like to make all the S's at the end of their words silent. And we're going to fly over four sites in rapid succession, and this one for some reason does have a lot of popping because of the add-ons and mods, so just brace yourself for that. So I'm going to tell you what they are, and then we'll enjoy them as we fly over. The first of the Chateau de Tours, which you would think would be the most opulent, considering this is the biggest city that we're flying over, but that is definitely not the case. In fact, we'll barely be able to see it. Far more impressive is the Tour Cathedral, which is on the next block to the south. And that's the fourth cathedral on that site, and I'll bet you'll never guess what happened to the first three. And it was completed in 1547, after nearly 400 years of construction. And I'm going to keep that in mind next time I'm griping about how long it's taking him to fix up the road in front of my office. We should really be grateful we're living in modern times. 400 years. That's a long time to build one building. A little further south, we're going to see a uh, strange-looking little place called the Vinci International Congress Center, which appears to be a performing arts theater, but it's really long and skinny. I've never seen anything like that that does that. And then we've got a beautifully filthy train yard that we'll fly over. And finally, the Valley du Cher Soccer Stadium, which we'll see as we head out of town. All right, once we take this next southern turn is when we're going to see everything. But this, again, is the biggest town that we're going to fly over. See all that popping going on there? I don't know why it's so bad here, but it's going to be even... You know, sometimes as you're further away and get closer, it'll pop, but this is just going to keep doing it as we fly over it. But it looks awfully fallish down there, doesn't it? 
here in Jacksonville, well, anywhere in Florida, Jacksonville is about as far south as you can go, maybe another 50 miles south and still get anything that even closely resembles fall in any way in Florida. Some of our trees, leaves will change, and if it gets cold enough for long enough, some of the other leaves will just eventually turn brown and fall off, but we don't get any of those beautiful fall colors down here, which is one thing I really miss about living up north. And we got our first snap of fall weather temperature-wise a couple days ago. Overnight, it got down to the middle 70s, which is really just, man, I almost had to put an extra shirt on for that. All right, so the cathedral is going to be on the other side of this bridge up here, and again, it's really, really hard to spot it, so we'll see if we can check it out. It looks like just, um, and it does look like it does in real life, but it's just really small, so we'll see. Another great-looking bridge down there, nice-looking bridges over there. Oh, man, it might be that cloud overhead maybe making it too dark to see it. Man, I think it is. I think it's going to be too dark to see it. But just pick a long building and say that's it because that's pretty much what it looks like. You know what? I think that's it right there. That is it over there. And you can see it's nothing special. So here's the Performing Arts Center. Look at that thing. Imagine having to sit in the back of that if the stage is at one end of that. That'd be horrible. And this train yard, look at that. It looks so, so good. And here's the stadium. We're going to take a turn here, fall along the river, and we'll take a look at the stadium, which also looks great. Before the add-on, the stadium looked like, a, like an eight-story high, just bull sitting there. I'm like, what the heck is that? But it looks as it should now with this add-on. Man. All right, I'm going to turn the clouds off because I don't want to have to deal with anything obscuring any of our views. That's too bad because I was kind of enjoying those, but... We'll just give it clear skies. Look at all this detailing down here. This whole area, the streets look good, the buildings look good. Really, really nice. Other than that little bit of popping that we're getting there. Look at that train yard. You know I love a good train yard. And that looks beautiful. Just fantastic. Look at that thing. That must be a water tower. Alright, we'll check out the stadium real quick. Look at that. Have you ever, ever been to Europe? I have some friends and my own brother went out there for a while. Unlike the United States, it sounds like everyone goes everywhere by train. There's that stadium. Look at that thing. Really nice. But train tracks all over the place out here. Most of the old train stations in the U.S. have been torn down. They stopped doing that probably in the 60s or 70s in the U.S. Built up the interstate highway system. All right, we're going to head southwest along the Cher River here for about 16 miles before arriving at my second favorite chateau in this flight, and then we'll see the final home of a very famous historical figure. And then we've got some funky gardens to check out, another beautiful city, and finally, saving the best for last, we'll check out my absolute favorite castle in the Loire Valley right before we come in for landing. But there isn't much other than the beautiful landscape to see before our next stop, so you can either skip ahead a few minutes if you like, or just kick back and enjoy some tunes. I'll see if I can cook up some to fit the setting so we'll be there probably i don't know don't go ahead too far i'd say within the next five minutes we'll be back see you in a few
right, guys, we're coming up on the Chateau de Chalonceau, and this is the one that is very obviously built in the middle of a river, or more precisely, built across a river. And what's really cool about it is that they didn't build it on an island. The place sits up on stilts so that the river runs underneath it, which is totally awesome. And you can see it right up there above the glare shield. And it looks like that because it was built in 1522 on the foundations of an old mill that once sat along the side of the river. And then they added the extension and the, the gallery that sits on top of the little bridge part that spanned the whole river. That was done in the 1570s. And there was an older castle on the property from the 13th century that wasn't around long before it was intentionally burnt down to punch the owner, a guy named punish the owner, not punch. Well, I guess it was kind of a punch. A guy named Jean Marquis for sedition against the crown, which is definitely worthy of burning your whole house down. But Marquis rebuilt both his chateau and the old mill on the site in the 1430s, but would wind up having to sell it to a guy who tore everything down and built what's down there today. But he did retain the old keep, which you'll see standing off to the left of it here. And from there, it experienced the obligatory royal swapping until acquired by a Cuban millionaire in 1981. and 1891, sorry. And in 1913, look at this place. So there's the original keep down there. Look at that. The water runs right underneath it. it goes all the way across the river. And in World War I, it served as a military hospital. And in World War II, it was bombed by both the Germans in 1940 and then the Americans in 1944. And as if the Nazi bombs weren't enough, some river water was rubbed into the wounds also in 1940 when the river here flooded and ruined all the gardens. But once all the dust settled, and the entire flooded, bombed out mess was fully restored to its original beauty in 1951. It still looks phenomenal today. All right, so we're heading back up north to catch up with the Loire once again, which we will follow for the remainder of our journey. And we got a bit of a hat trick at this next site because we're going to get to see three points of interest in the town of Amboise. And the first one is the Chateau Guillard, which I had a tough time finding on my first pass because it's kind of tucked in the bottom of a little cliff. But I redrew our flight path to approach it from a better angle, so it should be easier to spot this time. And I couldn't find much of particular interest about that, but it's right next to some of the others. But one thing that is worth noting is that it was the place where Mary Stuart, a.k.a. Mary Queen of Scots, went for her honeymoon. So I'll show you where that is, and if we look a little bit further east, we'll find a far more fascinating landmark, also an add-on. And that's known as the Chateau de Clos Lucy, and that was built in 1471. And in 1490, it was purchased by Charles VIII and was used as a summer retreat for French royalty for the next 200 years. And during that time, starting in 1516, a 64-year-old Leonardo da Vinci was invited to live in the home after being appointed the first painter, engineer, and architect of the king. And he was awarded a handsome annual pension along with an agreement to buy all of his artwork, allowing da Vinci to enjoy the remainder of his days before dying on the premises two years later in 1519. And he was buried just up the road at the Chapel of St. Hubert, which is on the site of our final landmark in Amboise. And it's going to be right up along the river, that last place. And it's called the Royal Chateau of Amboise. And I couldn't figure out how old the original structures of that big place were, but I think it may go back as far as the 9th century. And in 1434, whatever was there at the time was seized by Charles VII after the owner was convicted of, you guessed it, sedition against the monarchy. And then once in royal hands, and with the support of royal coffers, the place was almost entirely rebuilt into the current behemoth that you're about to see. And in 1498, King Charles VIII died at the castle after bumping his head on a doorway. What a bummer that is. All right, let me see if we can spot this first place because I couldn't see it very well before, but I think we'll be able to catch it now. All right, this is it right here. And it's not much to look at, but they put some big orange groves in here, which apparently don't grow well. So they had to do a little agricultural engineering and that's kind of what the claim to fame is of that place, but you couldn't see it coming from this way because it's tucked down behind this hill here. And this place here, which looks a little discolored, but at least it's easy to spot it, is the place where da Vinci lived and died. And then here's the big castle and chateau up here, and he's buried in a little, I think maybe this is the church over here, but you can see that place is big and looks nice right along the river there. Very cool. All right, we're going to turn east here 
and I'm not sure if we'll flatten out in time to see this next one. I tried to redraw this flight plan too, but it's just such a hard turn to make unless we go way out and then turn around to come back to see it. But even if we can't, I want to tell you about it because it's the Chateau de Fourche. It was built in the 18th century, so it's also pretty young as far as these places go, and it's not of the traditional style of a lot of these bigger chateaus. Let's take one more look at that big castle down there. Oh, we're about to lose it. Oh well. And though I'll wager you've never heard of the guy who originally built it, you'll probably recognize the name of the current owner. It was purchased in 1980 for 2.2 million francs by Rolling Stones frontman Mick Jagger. Yep, we're gonna fly right over it. Dang it. That's okay. I'll show you what it looks like on the satellite map. Nothing impressive compared to these other places, but Mick Jagger owns it, and apparently that's where he was hiding out during COVID, too. And I didn't know this until uh, I was looking around for information on that chateau, but he also bought and then sold a property down here in Florida for his girlfriend. And I'm a huge Stones fan, and I really don't care all that much about the details of anyone's personal life, but I was a little slack-jawed to see that his girlfriend and him not only have a six-year-old son together, but that she is 44 years younger and quite attractive, especially standing next to Mick. But then again, there are some benefits to being a royal. So good on you, Mick. He'll probably trade her in for a newer, newer model when he's, what, 90? 115? And I forgot to turn the wind off, but that's fine. We're jolting around a little bit here. Look at all that stuff. Wonderful. And to get even a little tiny bridge like that done well, this river looks good. We haven't seen too many. Some of the river edges didn't look great, but these all look really, really nice. And I didn't take a lot of flights out here in France before they modified it during the world update, so I don't know if it used to look worse, but other than the weird coloration we've seen in some of those spots, this looks really good, just as it is. Of course, if you're going to take this trip, you got to put the add-ons in for all the chateaus. All right, while we're flying along the Loire here and have a few minutes, I'll give you some details about the river that I found rather interesting. The name Loire is derived from the Latin word Liger, which means silt or sediment. So that tells you something about what the coloration of the water is probably like. And this is the longest river in France, shedding water from 20% of the country's landscape while flowing 634 miles from south to north. It starts almost on the southern shore of France. And I read that it's also the only natural river remaining in France, but I'm a little skeptical of that. So natural, according to the definition of the site I was looking at, means there aren't any dams or anything stopping it up. But I would guess that needs to be further qualified because we saw several other smaller rivers on this flight that were also unobstructed. So maybe it's the only major river that isn't dammed up in any way. And I guess chateaus don't qualify as anything that blocks the river because obviously at least one of them is in the middle of it. Actually, that wasn't in the, that wasn't in the Loire, so I guess that doesn't count. And though not incidental to the river, while I was looking into fun facts about it, I was reminded that France was home to a very large Neanderthal population. Those guys and gals were roaming all over the place and inhabiting caves out here as long as 335,000 years ago. And there's even some evidence that they were swapping caves with local homo sapiens in southern France roughly 54,000 years ago. So they were running into each other, and according to my DNA test anyway, apparently sleeping with each other, because I do have a small portion of Neanderthal DNA. Which explains my relatively pronounced brow. And strong will. But archaeologists say it's hard to figure out precisely who was living, living where and when, because there aren't a lot of skeletal remains, mostly just evidence of some sparse, exi sparse existence within the caves. And the only thing they found to indicate that Neanderthals and humans were together was a single tooth, so maybe that's a big leap to get to that. All right, we've got the Chateau de Chaumont up here, and it sits up on a hill overlooking the river. And we'll see what we can spot of that, but it's got some wild looking gardens. So this is it here, and it's got these crazy looking gardens down here, which you can see very, very clearly in the satellite map. But that was the big claim to, play, uh, claim to fame of this place. Yeah, all this here is like these modern art sculpted gardens. You can kind of see it a little bit. I'll show you it on the satellite map. It looks crazy. So like all the others, I'll just give you the cliff notes on this one. It's old, it's big, it was destroyed by an angry king, it was rebuilt. And now it's open to tourists. There you go. You could probably say that about all of them. Well, look at that. Now there's another forest fire looking area up there. Oh, well. Maybe that's just always there because I pulled out for season. All right. So up here, we're heading into the home stretch. We're going to fly over the center of the town of Blois up here. And once we get over this forest fire, area, maybe they really did have a forest fire. <laughs> that's what it looks like. 
And we're going to check out a few sites as we head out to our final and my favorite castle before coming back to Blois and landing just at the north of town. So this is Blois up here. We're going to check out a few spots in there. And like everything else around here, Blois is an ancient region of human settlement with several archaeological sites yielding evidence of cyclical prehistoric camps, which means folks would travel to different locations throughout the year, camp out here for a little while, move to another place, fish it out, hunt it out, move to a new spot, harvest all the berries, eat all the sticks. And 20th century excavations revealed the location of a densely populated urban area from Roman times right along the banks of the river here. And during the Renaissance, the commune, which is apparently what they call towns in France because they all kept referring to them as communes when I was looking around online, but this place was chosen as the official residence of the King of France. And boy, did those guys like to move around, didn't they? I feel like a king has either lived and or died at every town we've flown over so far today. Heck, in every chateau we've flown over, just about. And if he didn't die there, he made sure the owner did, so he could take it, burn it down. And what's crazy is that a lot of these places were vacant for like hundreds of years at a time. Which is just crazy to think about this kind of stuff just sitting out here like that. I mean, of course, a lot of them got looted and stuff over time, but... A lot of them were scheduled to be destroyed, and then they wound up converting them to things like hospitals or universities or museums or something like that. But it's just crazy to think. I mean, in the U.S., it's the same thing. The Vanderbilt's huge, huge. The biggest mansion in, in Manhattan when those guys were down there, that got torn down. Paving the way for progress. All right, we're going to look for two big landmarks down here, and both will be on this side of the river, and one will be... Up on the opposite, the other side of the middle of these three bridges that we're going to be up here. So that's going to be, we're going to see up here. So that's going to be kind of our visual cue to look for it. Because this is a big city and it's kind of tucked down amongst all the other structures down the city. But the one on this side of the bridge is the Chateau of Blois. And the first castle on that site was built sometime before 854. And I know that because that's the year where the whole place was sacked by Vikings and they tore everything down and burned it. And they started piecing together the current palace in the 900s and kept on adding to it all the way up until the 1600s. And its first royal residence arrived in the 1490s with the crowning of King Louis XII, followed by King Francis I, followed by King Henry III, then Henry IV, all enjoying plenty of important activities like scheming, strategizing, and probably redecorating. And there were at least two assassinations of royal enemies at this castle, just two days apart, right before Christmas in 1588. I guess once the smell of the fresh tapestries wore off, these kings just moved along. Alright, let's see if we can spot this place. We're not quite there yet. And by the time of the French Revolution, there it is right there. That is big though, isn't it? And very well detailed, actually. Look at that big clock tower or something there next to it. But by the time the French Revolution rolled around, that place was already vacant for 130 years, right in the middle of town. Crazy. And there's a big church there. That's the Blois Cathedral. And other than looking neat, I'd like to point out that that may be the only old cathedral in the world that wasn't destroyed by fire at some point in its history. But instead, that one was destroyed by a storm in 1678, which must have been one heck of a storm. And it got another good drubbing from American bombers during World War II that the worst of that damage was getting all of its stained glass windows blown out. And they didn't replace those until the year 2000. So I guess they just had regular old windows in there after that. All right, guys, you ready for the grand finale? We're about six miles west of the Chateau de Chambard, and this place is just insane. And I think this is one of the ones that was a default add-on in the sim. In other words, it's already in the sim. You don't need to install any add-ons for it. But it is the biggest of the chateaus in the Loire Valley, and you won't doubt that at all when you see it. And here's what's so crazy about that. It was built in the 1500s as a hunting lodge for King Francis I, whose primary residence was that place we just saw back in Blois, <laughs> like five miles behind us. So that massive place was in the middle of town, and then he built this even more massive place out here as his hunting lodge. And this is going to have everything you could ask for. Huge water features, a bona fide moat, immaculate gardens, turrets, walls, a keep over-the-top opulence. That guy left nothing to the imagination when he built this up. Quite a hunting lodge. And there's one of the waterways right there going out. There's a really long pond going out away from it, and then the main structure is right going to be right here. And there's so many random spires and towers and chimneys along the top of it that if you look at it from the ground, you could mistake it for a cityscape. 
and that wasn't an accident. The, uh, the guy that built it, Francis, he said he wanted it to look like the skyline of Constantinople. And it does. Wait till you, I don't know if we'll be able to see it real well in the sim, but when you look at it from the ground, from the front, it really does. It seems like there's no rhyme or reason to how they uh, put that together on the top. But he got his wish, because it does look like the skyline. I don't know what the skyline of Constantinople looks like, but being the king, I'm sure that he got it pretty close. And if you haven't explored this place online, well, if you feel like checking out any of these, this would be the first one I'd pick, because it is insane. But you know what? It actually feels and looks like you're walking around, let's see, it would be kind of like uh, if you've been to the National Gallery of Art in D.C. It's a lot less like a residence, because it's so huge, and more like a museum inside there. But despite all that went into this ridiculously overbuilt building, it was also nearly lost to time and outrage. In 1792, during the French Revolution, the revolutionary government ordered all of its furniture and even the floors and wall paneling sold off for timber. And to stay warm, the people that were managing the liquidation burned all the doors inside the place. <laughs> that is insane. And after that, it sat abandoned until it was used as a makeshift field hospital during World War I, or during the uh, Franco-Prussian War. That was in the 1870s. Look at this. Look at the gardens. Look at that. And look at all the crap up on top of it there. And it just looks perfect here in the sim. Like probably a little vegetable garden or something down here. And look at this big water thing they got going. We're going to turn here and take another look at it. Look at that thing. Look how good these hedges look. Just amazing. If you do nothing else on this flight, be sure to come out here and check this thing out. So they really didn't start seriously restoring that place until after World War II, during which an American B-24 Liberator crashed into the, uh, one of the gardens down there. Which isn't funny, but it did happen. So they cleaned up that mess. That would have been cool if they just kind of covered it over and left it as a little museum. A little sacrilegious, but would have been neat to look at these days, once those wounds have healed. Look at that. Man, so beautiful. And with that, we'll head back to Blois for our approach to Le Bruyere Airport, Lima Foxtrot Oscar, Quebec. And this is the only place with a decent sized tarmac around here, and unfortunately there were no freeware mods available. And as always, if you feel like hanging out, we'll take a look at all our sites from the satellite map, so you'll know where to throw your bookmarks in little nav map if you're wanting to take this flight. That's, if anyone knows how to import the bookmarks as well, I'm sure that would be helpful for some of you guys. Because if you don't know exactly where some of this harder to spot stuff is, it would probably be quite helpful to have the bookmarks to know where they are. So if you know how to do that, let me know and maybe I'll add a second little file with the bookmarks in there. And we've got them all over the world now. Because we've been a lot of places. I'm going to try to start slowing down just a little bit here. And on that note, I'm considering posting a very basic tutorial for Little Nav Map. I know I'm not big on tutorials unless it's germane to what we're doing here on the channel. And you know I threw that one up explaining how to load our flights, which I mentioned earlier up into the sim, but I've heard from a few folks, and I figured, as usual, I was the only one on Earth that didn't know how to use a little nav map, but some of our members have said, yeah, you know, I know the very, very basics, and some people didn't know anything about it at all. And I think it's useful enough, if you're flying airliners, like for that I use SimBrief for everything, because I don't really care about what's on the ground, but if you're wanting to make sure you hit certain spots because you want to see neat looking stuff on the ground, you'll probably want to be familiar with little nav map. And there are some great in-depth tutorials. John Beckett's done some great ones. But if you just want a real quick and dirty how to get your feet wet, how to put a flight in there, get it loaded into the sim, I might throw a little tutorial up for that because it would probably be handy. You know, something maybe 15 minutes long at most. Show you some of the most commonly used features and how to do them just real quick so you don't need to get the full semester-long course on how to do that. So you can look forward to that here in the next few weeks probably. And I'm far from a master of the program. And I don't really use it for the super complex stuff. But if you're doing radio navigation and stuff like that, you can do all that in there too. It makes it a lot easier. And I'm sure most of you aren't holding your breath for our next release throughout the week. But if anyone was, this flight really bogged me down. It was just so interesting. And some of the spots uh, that we had to see, I had to redraw our flight plans. And then I had to get the add-ons to start working. So it bogged me down a little bit. It took a little bit longer than necessary. But that process does take a lot out of me, though I enjoy every second of it, so I'll probably load up that nav map tutorial and then we'll do a few short hops to give my brain a little rest over the next couple weeks. And before we land here, I just have to give a few shout outs to some of our members. If you've been around, you know that last video I said, hey, YouTube is throttling our exposures because our click-through rate is going up and up and up with every video, and the views are going down, 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 which means YouTube is just not posting them 
all of our members always come back and check them out, but you know, we want to have more members because then we find out more places to look at. But it's been really throttled down. And I said, hey, I don't want money. You know, subscribing is nice, liking it, that's great too. But what really fuels me is people saying they are having a good time. And a lot of you did, and I really appreciate that. So I want to mention a couple of you guys. They've been around for a long time and very supportive of everything we're doing. And I know you all well enough that I don't even have to scroll back through my conversations to figure out what your handles are. One of those guys is Jay Ress. You send props for every one of my flights, and I appreciate that so much. YT Pathetic. That guy's been amazing. And he's from the UK, so he's given us some great stuff to check out in that area, too. Mike Coffee, really appreciate you, brother. Thanks for everything you're adding to my life and to the channel. Skinny Fat, the eccentric milliner, and of course, Hobie Gal. Love you guys all. You're awesome. Thanks for the support. And for all the rest of you, can't thank you enough. Life is too short for nerds like us to keep lurking in the shadows. So let's do this thing together as we explore this incredible planet of ours. And on that final note of unity, I've worn out all my baseball caps, so I've been kicking around the idea of making a little custom hat with just our logo on the center. You know, that little luggage tag looking thing with a plane on it. And I don't want to make any money off that stuff, so if you're interested in something like that, let me know. I think what I'll do is maybe just design it and then put it on one of those sites where you can just, uh, you know, you can buy it if you want to directly from the site. I don't want to have to deal with mailing anybody anything anyway, but let me know if you're interested in that, and I'll do it sooner than later. And since this has always been a personal endeavor for me, and I never wanted to be just a disembodied voice on this channel, and I'm not real keen on the little, you know, picture-in-picture -picture thing where you can see the guy talking while he's doing whatever he's doing on the screen. I think that'd be a distraction and definitely an immersion breaker for what we're doing. But this is personal for me, and I want to get to know you guys personally, so maybe when we hit 500 subscribers, I'll just upload a little celebratory thankful thank you video so you can relieve your brain of trying to imagine what I look like. I'll probably just put it on our community page so it doesn't go up on the regular YouTube feeds. But that'll be a little gift to all you guys that have drawn out sketches of what you think I look like. Now you'll know once we get there. So, one more thing to look forward to. All right, let's slow way down. Need to get these gears out. Not a real long runway, so we're going to have to... Really just, oh, he wants me to get the gears done. All right, let's do it, but I think I'm going too fast. Heck, I may have to abort if I can't slow down enough. Do a go-around. Now I can cut the throttle. Well, I got too busy thinking about baseball hats and sending out videos of myself. All right, flaps down. I think we'll hit it just right. And despite not having any add-ons, that looks pretty nice, actually, from here. We'll go down to that second taxiway, because there's no way in heck we're going to make that first one. Then we'll pull over and take a look at the little nav map. And there's a lot of neat stuff to see there. Let's see if the detailing of these plowed fields looks as good from up close as it did from the air. Thank you. Radio altimeter. And I've been trying to think about something cool we could do in one of the bigger jets. You know, you can't fly like a longitude or H jet around what we're doing, but I really like flying my jets, especially the big ones. We could never do an airliner on here. Now we're doing any sightseeing, but maybe something. If you guys have any ideas of something we could do in the jets, let me know, because I'm looking for a reason to fly one of those. Of course, we got those little guys like the one we used out in West Virginia, which is cool. But I'm still going pretty fast. Come on, burn off that speed. Burn it off, burn it off, burn it off. And we'll slam on the brakes. All right, just right. Flaps up. I'm guessing this is probably a pretty heavy plane if the brake sensitivity is accurate because you can stomp on them and it still takes a while to slow down. Alright, what kind of hangar we got over here? Let's see, we'll pull over this one by this windsock. Yeah, but this isn't too bad. I don't know what the actual airport looks like, but nothing I would say looks so horrible that it demands an add-on. But again, there's just not much else out there. There's some little ones, like really little that I don't even know if I could put this plane down at, but this was the closest one, which wasn't too far away, so it's it's perfectly fine. All right, let's see. That looks like a taxiway, so we'll cross that. I don't want to get too close to that fuel thing, or you know what's going to happen. It's going to ask me if I want to fuel up. Beautiful out here. Just so beautiful. All right, we're going to park right here. And just because I can't help myself, let's listen to this engine. Oh, beautiful. Sounds amazing. All right. Parking brake on. And let's check out a little nav map. Okay. 
so here's where in France we are. And originally you can see some of the other chateaus I was bookmarking. This is Paris up here. And here's another one down here, but these were all, there's some more way down here. But look how close all these were. And once I saw all those mapped out, I was like, yeah, that's what we got to do. We're going to have to go to that area there. So there's, there's France there, so you can see what's going on. So the Loire actually starts down in here. It flows all the way up this way and then spits out over here by Nantes, which looks like Nantes. Okay, so here's where we started from. And here's that nice little taxiway. I just, I love that. I thought it looked so neat to just have that little taxiway driving out there through the woods. So that's it. That's Sucel. And we came over here to get around that little seam. And then here's what that first place would have looked like if it rendered properly. So you can see that is very traditional looking castle wise. And this site actually looked quite a bit like that. There's that moat, but over here just looked like a big uh, rectangular building. So that wasn't quite right. And it looks like, I don't know if they have a roof on that. So that may be in ruins there. But let's look at this place that I think is a military installation. So look at this. You can see why I thought it was a road track. Look at all that. And there's that, uh, there's that airstrip there coming down the side. You get real close and I mean, I think that's an airstrip. You guys think so? They usually don't have two lines on them, though. Maybe it's a drag strip, but they don't have any burnout marks, so I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that. And here's the little uh, shooting ranges. So there's the one that we saw, and again, looked just like that in the sim, just absolutely perfect. And then here's the other one. Look, they got the little building in there, so that's definitely an urban warfare training place, or at least house-to-house -house combat, building clearing, anyhow. But look, no planes anywhere, no military vehicles of any kind anywhere. But somebody's got some above-the-ground pools out there, so I don't know what that is. Let us know if you know. Now here, here's the town of uh, Angers, and that's the main river running through there. And here's that first castle we saw, which looked just like that, albeit a little bit darker in the sim. Just beautiful. And then here's that big cathedral out here. And then here's that stadium that we saw, which looked exactly like that in the sim. Beautiful. Absolutely perfect. And then we came down here to the Chateau de Brissac. This is the one that's the tallest in France at seven stories which may have looked better in the sim even than it does there. But that was pretty cool. And then we came over here to... What was next? Oh, this was the one that looked like the Disney World. Okay, from the above, you can definitely see those ramparts going out. So this was the old fort that the whole thing was built on top of. And that, man, you really can't just appreciate what the profile that looked like from above. But in the sim, that is the one that looked like the Princess Castle in Disney World. Really, really neat looking. And we came to the Abbey down here, which is where all the kings and their wives are buried. And that looked cool. Very, very cool. And then here's where the castle up on the hill was. And now you can really see. So if this road is the ancient road that was going through there. It obviously split the castle there. And they probably had some gatehouses and stuff there. So this is the area where the museum is now. And yeah, you can see a lot of the turrets. Well, it looks like that still has a top on it. But from the ground, most of this stuff looked like it was still in ruins. But that's not. That's where the museum is now. And then we cruised out here. And this is the one that's on the little island. And you can see the river. I mean, it's just not much of a river going around there, but it does create an island. So that's, and you know what? In the sim, it looked like this part was rented as grass. And it is definitely more of an island than I bet back in the day. They didn't have this big driveway there, but you got to have somewhere for the tourist park. Well, there's where the tourist park. I don't know. Hmm. And that's, this is the guy that was saying, oh, yeah, you got to build this place up. All these vagrants and vagabonds in this town, they're going to come out here and kill me. And the king said, all right, here's some more money. Shut up. Here's the gardens of this place, the Landry. And they look just like that in The Sim too. Very cool. <laughs> look how small the house is compared to all these gardens. Look at that. Crazy. And here's that unknown castle. Look at this place. Look at that. Let's get real close. I mean, they got the nice little garden in there, some gardens over here. But somebody's car is parked right in front, and there doesn't appear to be a tourist parking area, unless that would be it. But if it was a tourist place, there'd definitely be some sort of notation about that. And then they got the swimming pool with the lounge chair. So I'm thinking that may be a private residence or maybe some kind of resort. But if it was a resort, that even more lounge chair. So I don't know. Enlighten us if you know. Okay, and then we came to Tour here, which is spelled Tours. And there's that tiny, there's the chateau right there. That's it. You can see why we couldn't spot the thing. And there's the huge cathedral that they had down there. And then there's that performing arts center. Look at this thing. I've never seen anything like that. There's some beautiful train stations. There's that field, which looked just like that. If you don't install the add-on for tours, this is going to look comically ridiculous, but it will look like that, as you saw, if you install it. And they came in here and saw, saw this place, which is the one that was going across the water. And that looked awesome, and just like it does in real life. And you know, I was thinking that that garden right here looked like it was bent or warped, but you can see that it actually looks like it does go down. 
So that's interesting. When you fly over that again, look at that. This one looks like it's like something's wrong with it, like it's melting off to the side. But I think because it is at an angle like that, that that was probably accurate too. And this was that old original keep that he kept there. So I'm guessing the mill that was originally out here was probably this thing. And then they built all this stuff out much later. And then here's where old Leo da Vinci lived and died. And there's that little place tucked down by the hill there. And I don't know where their orange groves are, but they must have been somewhere out here. And there's Leo's place. And I think the add-on... It looked a lot bigger than that, so maybe this is also part of it because it seemed that this whole area was modified because it was that darker color. But that's definitely part of his house there, and it was quite a nice little place. And then here's where he's buried, right up here, at the Chateau d'Amboise. And that looked awesome. And then here's where Mick's place is. Yeah, we couldn't have seen that. We flew right over the top of it. But pretty paltry compared to all the rest of it. But he got his gardens, so yeah, that's probably his car right there. And it's probably his hot girlfriend hanging out outside. A little kid running around. Man, 44 years younger. Good grief. Uh, and of course, I think she was a model or something like that. Okay, so here's the Chateau Chamont. And here's the one of the funky gardens. Look at these things. Look at those gardens. Yeah, it didn't look anything like that in the sim. But the Chateau looked pretty good. And this is where the gardens would have been. There's another little patch of them over here as well. But the building looked nice. And then let's see. Now we get to the town of Blois. And here's the big place where the king lived that built his hunting village out there, which we'll see in just a second. So <laughs> we'll take a look at how close that actually was to the hunting village. And there's that big cathedral that was out there, the one that hasn't burned down yet. That one got destroyed by the storm, though. So let's see how far that is away. It is 7.6 miles. So that was probably, a, what, a full 20-minute walk back in the day? But look at this place. Man, and it was just spot on in the sim, right down to those hedges there. Absolutely incredible. Just looked beautiful. And then we came in for our approach and landing. So if you wanted to hit another airport, look, they got all these out here, but they're all tiny. The next big one's probably this one, St. Denis. And there's one way out here, but who the heck wants to fly all the way out there? You could fly back to this place, but that's going to be a good hike. So I'd say this is probably the one you want to come into, despite it not having any freeware add-ons or maybe a payware add-on. And that's it. That's our Loire Valley Tour. Expect some much shorter hops for the next few weeks. Again, I've got to go out of town this weekend for soccer, but I have got to give myself a little bit of a break. This one was a beast. Enjoyed every second of it, though. Hope you guys did, too. Can't wait to see you all again in the skies. Later.